So the next session is a fireside chat um, with our senior tech uh, reporter, Arjun Kapal. We'd like to come on stage and also bring out your guest, who's from Lenovo. The floor is yours. Thanks, Miriam. My pleasure. Thanks. Great. So this next session, um, I'm very excited about. Uh, we're going to be speaking to the largest PC maker in the world, one of the biggest smartphone makers in the world, to get an idea where the future of our gadgets are going. So I'd like to introduce Matthew Zielinski, the Executive Vice President of Lenovo. Matt, um, Lenovo made a lot of big announcements at the CES uh, show in Las Vegas uh, just very recently about AI computers. Um, just tell us, what does this mean? What does this experience look like? I think in general what I would say is AI is going to fundamentally change our relationship with technology. Mm. And when we all think about, and that was the consumer electronics show, so let's talk about what consumers know about AI. They really know ChatGPT. And yeah. so if you and I go into ChatGPT and we say, hey, plan us a week-long trip around the Swiss Alps, it'll plan you a week-long trip around the Swiss Alps. It'll do it very quickly, it'll do it securely. But the problem, and it's like a personal assistant, but it's like you and I sharing a personal assistant. And that's where the PC is gonna make this far more personal. So first of all, what a PC needs to be truly an AI PC is a few things. It needs Microsoft Windows 11 with Copilot. Mm -hmm. We're talking more brains now. We, instead of a CPU and a GPU, now there's something called a neural processing unit, which is going to do a lot of the AI computations that's calculated in trillions of operations per second. Yeah. And it so better chips. Correct, better yep. chips and more of them, and a compressed large language model. So now, in terms of what this means for a consumer, if you query and say, hey, plan me a five-day trip around the Swiss Alps, you're going to get a different answer than I am because your PC is fundamentally going to learn more about you and what you do and what you like and what you search. And if you're a foodie, it might send you to more michelin starred restaurants than it would for me. Right. And so it really is going to change your relationship for good and will eventually get to know you better than you know yourself. Yeah. And with, with AI computers, is this fundamentally a technology marketed for the consumer or is it more, or do you see more promise with enterprises and business? Well, first of all, let's be very clear. AI is nothing new. Yeah. So we started investing in AI, our first billion dollars was mm. back in 2017. And really, when you think about the future of AI, it's a hybrid world. You're going to have this public, you know, large language model and foundational models that will always live in the cloud and be there, and you'll have the enterprise version of that, which is partitioned off from the cloud, and you'll have a personal AI model, which lives in your PC. So the future is, is all things enterprise, et cetera. But, you know, since we've talked about PCs for a second, we haven't really talked about the infrastructure side of this. Yeah. And so the future of that, you know, right now we've seen this massive boom in the training aspect of AI. So big companies taking these new, very fancy systems with high-end GPUs and, and trying to get as much data into the system as humanly possible. That training phase has to happen one time in, in a big way. After that, it's retraining and kind of maintenance, and then it's inferencing. And the future of AI and the exciting part, particularly for the enterprise, is the yard of the possible on the inferencing side of this. In terms of, now that I'm collecting all this data, what can I do with it? How does it improve my productivity? How does it make me smarter? What are the benefits of that? And I think, you know, when you look into that in the future, and our investments, are a second billion will be invested in AI over the next three years, and we're spending hundreds of millions in developing sort of enterprise end user applications by verticals with 150 or 200 partners around the world that do this very specifically. There are new companies such that if an enterprise CIO, which is every conversation we've had this week and for the last two years of my life, mm. what do I do with AI? How do I, how do I work with it? We'll have turnkey solutions that you can basically plug and play in financial services and remote healthcare and retail environments. Mm. And so I think that will speed up the propagation of AI. And frankly, people are gonna lean on folks like us that yeah. have the expertise in the web of all these third parties that can bring it to life. Matt, in my uh, sort of portfolio of devices, um, in terms of usage, smartphone is number one, my tablet is number two, and a very distant third is my laptop. Uh, in, in the world where smartphones themselves have better chips, better on-device processing of AI. Um, same with tablets as well. What is the role of the PC going forward for, for, the, for the user, for the consumer? Well, look, I never like to uh, you know, remember the pandemic, but one thing it did teach us is that there is really no substitution for a full productivity device. Mm. So as much as I agree with you, we, might, we tend to spend more cycles on our, in my case, a Motorola Razor, yeah. you know, the, <clears throat> eventually there really is no substitution for that. Yeah. And so, we also think if you look at the future of the consumer market, you know, this, the AI PC is not an inflection point. It's not slimmer, faster, and better battery life. It's a true different usage model. And I think consumers will want a full experience with that. However, 
when you think about the future of AI, when we started talking about having these localized large language models, mm -hmm. or your personal twin, if you will, your personal assistant on your PC, that will also in the future exist on your smartphone. So you're gonna have AI galore and your relationship will change <laughs> with everything you use. Since you mentioned the razor, we may as well speak about smartphones as well. Um, when you uh, look at sort of the broader market, you know, uh, Samsung and Apple, globally, the, the two biggest players, what is um, Lenovo's strategy uh, to boost smartphone um, sales? What, what, are you, what are you planning on terms of innovation, in terms sure. of marketing, and, and how to differentiate and stand out? Well, like any device or any piece of technology, it all starts with product. Mm. And so if I look back in the last five or six years and I look at the Motorola portfolio, yeah. You know, five years ago, I couldn't stand up here and pass the red face test and say, we've got a kick-ass product. Yeah. Now I can, and pardon me, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that since we're... Uh, I think that's fine. Okay, I very, think. very good. <laughs> but so if I look at the billions we spent on innovation around, yeah. everything from making the screen better, better cameras, better seams in terms of our foldable technology, yeah. and then now as we start to plan for the future of bringing AI to your smartphone as yeah. well, that's paying off very handsomely for us. In fact... And it's also a business we've turned around and hyper-prioritized. So if mm. we were to sit and say, hey, Matt, where do you see the company in three years? We might be number eight or number nine globally in the smartphone mm -hmm. market. We're number three in the U.S. We're number one, number two in Latin America. I would bet a paycheck that mm. in three years we'll be number three around the world. Mm. And again, it all starts with product. And then it takes you know, a lot of you know, uh, brand building and things like that in new markets. So we're very surgical, very deliberate, but where we place a bet, it tends to pay off. So expect to see more Motorola. Can I have a quick show of hands? Who's used a foldable smartphone before? We've got Very few. Portable. So is that, do you think, you know, there's a lot of people who haven't used a foldable before. Is that because the form factor just isn't there yet? Or have you got a lot more work to do, just generally the industry on, on you know, talking about the benefits of a foldable? I've been playing with them for the past year. Well, I've first been, of all, we teamed fun. up with Pantone to do colors. Yeah. And so the last year's version of this, I just got the new one. First of all, this is called Peach Fuzz, which I had to ask if they were really serious when they told me the Pantone color, <laughs> but it is. Last year's was magenta, and it's yeah. a great conversation starter. Sitting in an airport, an NFL player, you know, pulls up, big dude, I've got a pink phone in front of me, he's like, what is that? Yeah. And so there's, you know, it really is a unique look and a unique feel. And frankly, you know, it, it's, it's just, it's something that fits so well in your hand. It just starts with an easier usage case. And then the functionality of what you have outside the phone when it's closed, whether it's messaging, checking your emails, and being a little bit more surreptitious about what you're doing so it's not so obnoxious where you're, you're having to go through the whole thing. There's just a real usage case. And frankly, we're almost up to, not sure I'm allowed to say, but, you know, over a million activations on just the Razor alone. So it really is taking a stab at the premium market, and frankly, almost all of those users are converting from one of our primary competitors that you can probably imagine that is not Android-based. Yeah, what, what's gonna propel uh, Lenovo and the Motorola brand to number three in the world, in the smartphone space? I think it's the continuation of building great products, yeah. and I think if you look at where we're big around the world, there's certain markets that we haven't even gotten started yet. We've right. made a lot of progress throughout Europe, we've made a lot of progress in India, it's probably one of our more strategic regions. Um, and so I think as we continue to enter markets, instead of trying to cast a really, really wide web all at once, really biting off not more than we can chew to make sure that we're growing it stably until we get to 10% or so in every country, yeah. so that we're not 2% in every country. So right. there's a bit of business strategy involved in how we're gonna go. So it's a strategic approaches to certain markets where you feel the brand can really take off. Correct, and yeah. keep those markets limited until you reach critical mass to then yeah. go to a, a market in close proximity. Yeah. What what do you think is going to be the next front of innovation on smartphones? So we were talking, I was talking to you backstage about foldables and saying, look, I've used the phones that fold outwards, I've used the phones that fold upwards, and both have their pros and cons. Sure. So the form factor on the foldable seems at this point to be sort of, you know, it's either going that way or it's going that way and, and take your preference. Well, now it's going to go this way. So basically, uh, okay. at, at, at Tech World in my hometown of Austin, Texas, back in October, we yeah. actually demoed uh, a, a, not even a prototype, it's an early manufacturing sample where basically, it's a, it, it, well, extendable is one thing. We also have foldable. So let me lay back up. We did both. We showed the extendable, which will be out, I think, this year or so next that's, year. Where that's, a, that's a screen like this, and a screen it, kind of comes out. It expands, and, and then it, it can retracts. go back down. So you've all of a sudden got a bigger. Correct. Right. And then the real future is one that almost hits like a, like a, like a snap wash. I don't even know how to properly yeah. articulate it. Like a foldy a, a piece very, of screen correct. that can go around. Something. Correct. So it could yeah. be a smartphone or it could be a watch right. appliance. And Do you like my technical language, folding well, piece of screen? I know you and I are yeah. I'm both str I'm struggling That's, to find the words to yeah. articulate it. It's like science fiction. <laughs> yeah. But it's real. <clears throat> what's, what's, the, what's the roadmap? Tell me about it. That's exciting. You know, everyone, <clears throat> we've got the Mobile World Congress coming up. 
That's a big show for the industry, the mobile industry. Um, what's the roadmap for these products, for the extendable screens, for these uh, sort of uh, foldy screen thingies? <laughs> yep. well, talk to me about what you're thinking about commercialization. Unfortunately, I can't tell you exact <coughs> timing on yep. all that's coming out, so I'm gonna have to keep you in suspense okay. on that, that question. Mm -hmm. But as we start thinking about you know, real roadmap, I'd actually take us back to the PC side of the business, right. which I think we did some big announcements last week with our high-end consumer lineup, the Yoga 9i Pro is something I demoed at CES personally. A lot of innovations around the commercial products, mm. but it really foundationally, no pun intended on foundation models and large language models, the innovation around artificial intelligence and the development of that and what it can do from a, a, a productivity and bringing software vendors on board to even make it come to life more, I think that's where you'll see a lot of the innovation in the next year or two. Matt, 2023 was marked by the fact that semiconductors somehow made it into the public imagination. Uh, and I haven't spoken so much about semiconductors in a long time. But there is a trend uh, amongst the biggest device makers in the world that if we're going to infuse our products with AI, we need the semiconductors to match, uh, to be able to do the processes you were talking about. That's right. Uh, and so you've seen companies like Apple and Samsung and Google invest in their own semiconductor uh, design uh, in order to tailor their products uh, to uh, the AI processes that they want to, the, ex the consumer to experience. Uh, from Lenovo and Motorola's point of view, are you looking into custom silicon at this point for your devices? It's, you have to consider it when you're in our industry. You know, the, the cool thing about what's happening with AI is it's drastically widened the stable of silicon providers. Mm. So it's no longer just sort of a two horse race for CPUs and a one and a half two horse race for GPUs. You now have AMD, NVIDIA, mm. Intel, Qualcomm, very serious players. You have smaller ASICs or FPGA chips that you can put in that can help orchestrate a lot of what's happening you know, in terms of what component is doing what for an optimized performance. We even have something called the Lenovo Core AI chip, which we didn't personally manufacture, but we designed and have somebody else do it with us yep. that does some of the additional functionality on, uh, on all of our AI-ready PCs. Mm -hmm. So I think over time, whether it's a company building it themselves, which is a very difficult exercise and yeah. takes a lot of expertise, or sort of the ability to tailor application-specific chips to try to differentiate on the AI side is something we're going to keep talking about. Okay. So, but, but at the moment, there's nothing to update on in terms of Lenovo custom Building selectors. your own stuff, not today. Not today. Um, the supply chain for your industry has, has been an intense focus as a result of COVID, as a result of the state of the world in terms of geopolitics, et cetera. Um, what are you doing to secure your supply chains? You were talking a little bit about the India market and how you know, Motorola has a strong brand there, but also manufacturing. Sure. Um, what, 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 how are you looking at the supply chain and making that safe and secure sure. for Lenovo? Well, it's one thing that, you know, when we have conversations like this, we're happy to brag about it. Just to, to and we're very humble people, but to show that we're pretty good at what we do. So yeah. we ship one device every four seconds all around the world. Mm -hmm. We have 35 manufacturing facilities in nine countries. We do more of our own manufacturing into our competitors. Um, we have, we were voted eight in Gartner's top supply chains last year. So the supply chain is like our thing. And you know, one thing we pride ourselves in is sort of this global, <clears throat> excuse me, global local model where we like the idea of having multiple avenues and multiple places to build in volume all yeah. across the planet. Whether we're talking Brazil, whether we're talking Monterey, Mexico, whether we're talking mm -hmm. Pondicherry, India, you know, or any place around the world. And I think, you know, as things change in this world, the fact that we have that flexibility is quite smart. For example, in India, you know, the local manufacturing, you know, regulations, if you will, or mandates, we're prepared. Will we ramp that facility? Absolutely. Yeah. If you think about some of the geopolitical dynamics and what we might have to toggle on scenarios there, absolutely we'll ramp our Monterey, Mexico site, our Brazil sites. And also, when you have this opportunity, you're bringing products closer to the customers, which when you think about our desire to be net zero by 2050, yeah. you're using less CO2, you're using less of the world to get your products into the hands of its users. Mm. Uh, just talk to me about India very quickly, because you, know, you walk along the promenade, there's a huge display from the Indian government, and clearly that government has talked about bringing high-tech manufacturing to the country. We've seen c companies like Apple and Samsung and others ramp up manufacturing there. Uh, what's the plan for, for Lenovo and India on the manufacturing front, given obviously the regulations around you know, local manufacturing? So first of all, I'm biased because all my best friends in the world growing up were mostly Indian. And so I, I, have a, I have a love for the country. And yeah. I'll be there in two weeks. And, and um, on, on the business side of it, it is by far one of the most strategic countries that we have around the world. Right. Um, and we just believe in, in uh, now that we've you know, made this leap to 5G, yeah. the ability to get technology into the hands of the masses where it was more difficult than before, mm -hmm. and having the breadth of portfolio that we have from the pocket to the cloud 
having the types of conversations we're having with the Indian government and having local manufacturing and looking at putting more jobs in the country of India, like we're gonna place as many bets as we can because we think the growth of the Indian you know, population is fantastic and they're wonderful people. Um, Matt, as a, as a business leader at Lenovo, how do you deal with the geopolitics right now? Um, there is, the reality is countries across the globe are competing with each other in key technologies they feel that are key to the future. AI is one of them, semiconductors another, and we've seen the US, for example, try to uh, use export restrictions to cut chips off from companies in China, and you've seen companies around, uh, countries around the world really compete on that front. Um, how, how concerned are you about access, your access to technology being cut off because of the geopolitics of the world right now? So first and, of all, and what's the contingency plan, I guess? Yeah, first of all, so we always, you know, apply and, 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 and abide to every rules and regulations of every market like we always have. That doesn't change. You know, and Lenovo's an interesting company. You know, we're, we're, we're proud of our heritage. We do business in 180 markets around the world, and we're truly seen as a very global organization, not in one or the other. We have dual headquarters. You know, if you look at our business, you know, combination, the international markets make up 77% of the company. So it, we're very unique in that sense. We're not a traditional company in any way where you would put it in any certain category. And I think people understand that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're going to continue to, to, you know, write our, play out our mission of smarter technology for all, smarter AI for all. And if we have to navigate, you know, through certain things, we'll absolutely do that. But it doesn't change our mission. It doesn't have any risk to where we're doing today. But at the moment, you're not concerned about access to tech being, being hampered in some way. Well, look, I think for the end consumer, you know, we're always going to have to work through whatever whatever arises in mm. certain export restrictions and things like that. But we have all kinds of business challenges that pop up every single day, and this is another challenge that we have to make sure we find a way through. Matt, we've got about a minute left. What's your longer-term vision uh, for the way people will be using devices over the next sort of five years infused with some of these, these, these AI applications. So I, I really love this notion of the personal assistant, you know, and we're able to see things behind closed doors in the future, whether it's through software or hardware vendors. And so I sort of have this picture of what it looks like, you know, in my mind, combined with all the huge innovations that we're gonna do. Mm -hmm. And I really wholeheartedly believe that your relationship will become <coughs> fundamentally deeper and your productivity will increase in a, in a working world. If you're, you don't have to think about things. If my wife's birthday is on a certain date, well, her flowers will show up and she likes <laughs> calendar, I don't have to worry about it. Yeah. So in every aspect of our life, we're going to have a lot more help to really unleash the full potential of ourselves. Yeah. And I know it for a fact, after seeing what we've done the last two years and last week, and the best is yet to come. I'm thinking Jarvis from Iron Man, kind of. Vibe. You know what? I've heard that before. And it's the perfect explanation. <laughs> yeah. So let's see, maybe three or four more years before that's anywhere we're at. But Jarvis is, is an, a perfect example of what life could look like. Great, Matt. Thanks for taking all the questions and, and you know, giving us an insight into what the future holds. Uh, Matt Zielinski, the executive vice president of Lenovo. Round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, 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 Thanks,